And thank you all again for being here. Um, it's obviously an, a really important topic and a really important time um, to be together and to get the facts. And so, as Corbett mentioned, um, I'm just going to give you the latest statistics. They are literally changing by the minute. Um, yesterday, as I was driving over here for this um, panel discussion, we went from uh, two deaths in the United States to six. And so that number has stayed the same. Um, so we've had six deaths in the United States. We have about 100 and uh, over 120 people infected in the U.S. Um, and now we have about um, 90,000 people infected worldwide. So um, those are some of the statistics that we have. It's in a, about 79 countries now. Um, that was as of 3 o'clock when I left the office and checked the numbers. Um, and so we obviously we know this is impacting not only our health and our wellness, but our um, stocks and financial systems. And so, you know, last week we had the, la the lowest um, stock market since the 2008. So this is really impacting our communities um, as we speak. And so what we want to do is give you guys some facts that you can take out into the community with you um, and, and then answer some of your questions. And so what I'll do is just kind of walk through some questions um, with our panelists, and then, and then I'll open it up um, for all of you guys to ask your questions. So um, with that, I will introduce the panelists very quickly. Um, Dr. Larry Schlesinger, most of you know, is, our, uh, prof is a professor at Texas Biomed, also our president and CEO. And then our, one of our newest faculty, actually I think our newest faculty member, uh, Dr. Luis Martinez Sabrito. He's been here all of two weeks, three weeks now by the end of this week. Uh, <laughs> so still learning his way around the institute. Um, but um, we've been able to uh, rope him into all of the things that we do at the Institute quite quickly. Um, so we're very glad that, that they're with us. Um, but with that, I'm going to go ahead and kick it off by first asking um, Dr. Martinez Sabrito to kind of walk us through the virus. What is it? When did we first recognize it? Um, give us a little bit of history on the virus. Okay. Well, first, I want to thank you, everybody, for coming and for the interest that uh, you showed for the work that we do at Texas Biomed, even under these circumstances with the outbreak of this uh, novel coronavirus or COVID-19 or uh, SARS coronavirus too, because it has uh, multiple names but refers to the same thing. As uh, you probably know by now, it's a virus that originated in Wuhan the, uh, city in the province of Hubei in China. It's a coronavirus, uh, a coronavirus that uh, has been circulating in, in animals probably for a long time. Coronavirus are not new to us. Uh, there are coronavirus that infect humans and there are coronavirus that infect animals. Actually, the common cold that we have is caused by a coronavirus, a human coronavirus. But since we have been exposed to this virus, we have some defense that protects us against this virus. That is not the case of this new um, COVID-19. This is a virus that we have never been exposed. It jumps from an animal that we still don't know what animal is and start uh, infected humans. And since we have never been exposed, the virus is able to replicate and we don't have mechanisms to protect us against the virus. And, and that's why it's spreading uh, so rapidly. Now, why an animal virus jump from an animal to human? Well, that's a very important question that obviously we want to address. Um, so to put it in a word, so uh, viruses use a key to enter a cell uh, or a lock. And usually animal viruses have a key that open only the, do the, the, the lock of, of animal cells. But viruses mutate, mutate uh, constantly. And the best example is influenza. I mean, and that's why, why we have to get uh, influenza vaccine every year, because the virus changes from one year to another. So in this case, in the case of this COVID-19, if there was a virus that circulated in animals, it mutate and it makes this key now able to open the lock of human cells. And that's how we got infected with the virus. And now what is established in humans, and since we don't have any persistent immunity, that's how the virus is replicated. Okay. At least it's, that's what we know so far. <laughs> Dr. Schlesinger, we've, so, Dr. Martinez Sabrito has referred to two different names of this, so SARS-CoV-2 and COVID-19. What's the difference? Well, so they're now, the way I see it on the news, they're being used interchangeably. Originally, uh, the WHO, World Health Organization, 
uh, had called COVID-19 the disease, um, the manifestation of infection, and the, and the SARS coronavirus, no, NCOR novel coronavirus, 2019, because the first cases began in 19, refers to the virus. Uh, the, but it's basically uh, just confusing the public, uh, and, the, and the words are used interchangeably, same virus. So Dr. Martinez Cerrito, you have expertise in influenza um, specifically. Um, we have expertise and in, in scientists who've worked on SARS. Can you tell us, and we're hearing that, there, that this particular virus is similar to both. So can you tell us how it's similar and how it's different to those two known entities? So um, this influenza and this uh, COVID-19 are completely, two completely different viruses. Uh, the only thing that they have in common is that they are both respiratory virus. Uh, they transmit by small droplets that we uh, create when we sneeze or when we cough, and that's what is very, very important, that when we cover our sneeze and our cough, so we do not, if we are infected, transmit. The best is to cough in your elbow or, or, or try to use a paper tissue that you discard right away. And the symptoms of influenza and coronavirus, or this novel coronavirus, are pretty much similar. Cause fever, uh, uh, sneeze, coughing, and some respiratory problems. Now, in the case of this COVID, and, and, and this is something that we are learning uh, one day <laughs> at a time, is that a lot of people is asymptomatic, and they only test people that have fever or develop some kind of respiratory uh, symptoms. But other people, um, similar to what happened with influenza, do not develop these symptoms and they might carry the virus. And they, they are not tested and they are going around and they are able to transmit the virus and uh, pass it to other people. So you're describing someone who is essentially asymptomatic, so they're not showing any symptoms, but they could potentially still be able to spread the virus. That's correct. OK. Um, can I, can I, go ahead. Uh, I want to enter in. Uh, disinformation, number one, for the crowd. Uh, this is not a man-made virus. This conspiracy theorists you read about and tell you it was planted and all of this nonsense. <coughs> and there's absolutely no evidence for that. Um, so um, it's still thought that this uh, emerged from that um, living animal market in Wuhan City. Uh, and um, just with regard to the virus a little bit more, because you may have been reading about this, the current thinking is the virus has been living in bats. Uh, bats have an interesting immune system, which we won't talk about much tonight, but it was carrying this virus. Um, so the bat would be the carrier. It, the bat is full of viruses, carries a lot of viruses. And then the virus jumped to a, what's called an intermediate host, which is usually another animal. So in the SARS outbreak, it was a, uh, a cat. Uh, and in the uh, Middle Eastern Respiratory Syndrome virus, the MERS virus in 2012, it was a, anybody know? Camel. 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 So does anyone know what is one suspected intermediate host for this one? A pig. pig. Mm, not a pig. Huh? Pangolin. Pangolin. So a pangolin is a very ugly animal. Look on your phone. It's a <laughs> scaly anteater. Long nose, uh, and uh, and uh, it uh, uh, they they um, sequence the virus out of this animal, and it's 99% identical to uh, COVID-19. Uh, now, 99, the way I read it, is not good enough. It's not good enough. Not good enough, as the virologist will tell me. That one percent is what it makes the virus. 100% would we'll tell you it's the definite immediate host. So it's still not 100% clear, but the thing about pangolins. Uh, for all those pangolin lovers that are in the crowd here. Uh, the, the pangolin uh, is actually, the meat of the pangolin is a, de a delicacy, and, uh, and this animal is poached in, in China. So it's popular on the markets in China, and so uh, this is the connection with that particular animal. All new for me. I didn't know any of that. It tastes like chicken? You know, when, I, when in doubt, I say they taste like chicken. I, I, I don't know. A year ago now, I was traveling in China. I was invited to 
visit some veterinary school in China, so I was traveling the, a couple of weeks. Luckily, it was last year. If it was this year, I would be stuck there. I would not be able to come back, or I, I would be quarantined. Um, and the reason is because, and completely unrelated to this COVID, but we developed vaccines for influenza in dogs and horses in our laboratory, but I was introduced to this uh, penguin, and I agree with Larry, it's the most ugly animal ever. <laughs> Compared to the pandas they have, they are very cute, yeah. <laughs> the point is that um, this so-called spillover is an example where a mutated virus can jump from animal to humans, and it really is as simple, if you will, of, of density of people and animals uh, and the ability for a virus to jump. Uh, and this is presumably how this uh, began. However, uh, when did it begin is still uncertain, and based on what you just heard from Dr. Martinez with asymptomatic cases, maybe we'll talk more about that. There's suspicion that the first cases may have been earlier in December and that we already may have been behind the eight ball a bit when we first started hearing about this virus. So there was already dissemination going on uh, prior to um, us becoming aware of it. And, and let me add with one thing, and this is not new. I mean, we know that viruses from animal jumps to humans, and the best example, again, is influenza. We are always aware or, 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 or very uh, worried about this avian influenza or this swine influenza that jump from avies or uh, ibis or um, swine species uh, and, uh, to humans, uh, like it happened during the, some pandemics in the past. So, Dr. Martinez Sabrito, you talked about basically viruses unlocking a key to our cells, but I want to take us all back to sort of basic high school biology again and explain to us specifically how a virus infects our cells. Well, uh, every virus is different, so it's uh, difficult to generalize here, but uh, in the case of, of this virus, like I say, the virus has a key in the surface, and this key opens this lock in the cell. Again, can be an animal cell, can be a human cell. Some viruses have master keys that open human and animal cells. And in the case of this virus, similar to influenza, is cells in the respiratory tract. That's where the virus replicate, and that's where it causes the, the disease. So your expertise is in developing vaccines. Explain to us, one, let's start with the first question is, what's the difference between a therapy or an antiviral and a vaccine? And then can you tell us a little bit about your research on it, looking for a specific vaccine for this virus? Okay, so a vaccine is to prevent you to get infected with the virus, uh, while an antiviral is once you're infected, uh, is to uh, control viral infection. So in, in our case, uh, we are uh, really interested in developing vaccines against viral infections, uh, uh, mainly focus on influenza. But not only influenza that causes disease in humans, also influenza that causes disease in animals. And I mentioned before, uh, we developed recently vaccines for the influenza in dogs and in horses that are uh, uh, very interested for uh, companies to develop it. And the reason why we want to develop uh, vaccines against influenza in, in animals is because uh, we know from the past how easy it is for the virus to jump from animal species to human, like the case of the COVID-19. So the best way to control that does not happen is by controlling the virus in these animals, and then it will not be able to, to infect us. In terms of actually the spread of this particular virus, um, and, and Larry or Luis, either of you can answer this, we're seeing lower mortality rates with this particular virus, meaning not as many, there are lots of infections, but not as many people are dying. Can you explain to us why that might be the case? Right. So um, this virus is 90% um, identical to the SARS coronavirus. But again, that 10% has made it a very different virus. So if we go back to SARS, um, this resembles SARS in infectivity, but it seems to be even more infectious than SARS was. It's a respiratory droplet transmission, so it's not as infectious as measles, for example, more of an aerosol transmission. Um, but what seems to happen when viruses and bacteria mutate 
is they might lose their, this is a science term, virulence, their ability to cause disease. Uh, and this seems to be the case here where transmission is, is amazing here around the world, 80 countries you're hearing about, it, 105 or whatever it is today in this country is only a matter of the test and we'll get back to the test later. Um, but um, I think looking at all the data and uh, looking at the age groups, looking at the so-called asymptomatic carriers, um, probably we're looking at, so there's two terms, morbidity, mortality. Cappy points out some of these terms we throw around. Morbidity is illness, mortality is death. Seems to be about 1%. When you think about influenza, um, they vary. 0.2%, 0.6%. I think one of the outbreaks was 2%. Um, uh, so 1% or less is, uh, from the standpoint of epidemiology, not a great number. But you know, it's a numbers game. So if it ends up the whole world's infected, then 1% is a pretty big number. Um, uh, but it does, the good news, and this is probably the best news of the evening, is that um, if you're healthy, if your immune system's healthy, uh, and um, you're not in an older age group, I'll get back to that, uh, chances are you're either gonna have no symptoms. <laughs> My wife said, my wife last night was here and said I had to be gentler about the way I talked about age. Um, she's not here tonight, okay. Uh, but um, uh, it looks like um, what you'll have is either no symptoms or a mild cold. Uh, looking at the data, uh, uh, um, as you get up in age um, and uh, over 55, and particularly over 80, uh, the, the uh, more severe disease increases. Um, the good news is children are not preferentially infected here. That's great news. So the curve just kind of goes up as we, as we get older. Um, and the numbers today uh, that we know from these data are that about 81% it's not working. 81% have um, uh, uh, this asymptomatic or mild disease, about 15% have more severe respiratory symptoms and then about 1% uh, uh, succumb to infection. So those are the numbers. And that's what is similar also to, to influenza. I mean, if you are uh, healthy, uh, you will not even develop or, or develop just mild symptoms. It's only people that have other um, healthy problems that get very sick or can die from this COVID infection. So, you know, there has been some discussion, of course, typically when something like this happens, there's a lot of discussion around the 1918 influenza. Um, I know you've studied this a lot and looked at it. Can you tell us what are some of the similarities and should we be as worried? Uh, well, some of the similarities will be um, that um, Probably the reason why the 1918 influenza killed uh, so many million people, about, uh, and depends who you ask, 40 to 50 million people, is because we have never been exposed to that uh, virus, similar to what happened uh, to this one. And another thing that probably is not going to happen with any other influenza or with this COVID is that the, the, the people that die for what he called the 1918 or Spanish flu in, in, in 1918, 1990, was not because of the influenza infection. It was for other bacterial opportunistic infections that come out after or during the, night, the, the influenza infection that nowadays we can control with antibiotics and, 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 and that will not happen. So essentially our healthcare system is, Correct. is helping us at this point. Correct. Um, so one question that has come up is how long can people be infected and assume that they're recovered but actually stay infected? Yeah, so this is uh, not such good news. Uh, <laughs> uh, first of all, it appears that the incubation period is somewhere around seven to 10 days um, uh, for this virus. Uh, and then uh, when, if they're going to have symptoms, develop symptoms, these respiratory symptoms. And then we know this infamous, infamous case in San Antonio just happened um, yesterday or the day before that uh, somebody at Lackland was released after two negative tests. The so-called PCR test, which is a molecular test, good test, uh, and then had a positive test after they were released, 
went around San Antonio, did a little shopping, and uh, next thing we know, we're emptying the North Star Mall and we're washing everything down and, and this person's called back into quarantine. Um, so what's happening there? Um, well, I mean, any test, any diagnostic test can have what are called false positive readings as well as false negative, and it may be related to something in the test, some technical glitch in the test. But about a week ago, there was an, an article published uh, in, a, in a, a strong magazine, JAMA, uh, that talked about this type of scenario where somebody can turn positive after they've been cured. Quote, unquote, cured clinically. Meaning symptoms went away, if they had an x-ray, it looked better, and we would, for all practical purposes, say they were over the infection. But the test turns positive and persistently positive, suggesting the possibility of a so-called carrier state. And in that article, that carrier state could last up to 24 days after the infection. Now, this is not good news because, um, as an infectious disease expert, um, I would tell you this is why I think tonight as we speak, we're in a very dynamic, dynamic phase of this epidemic, I think, impending slash whatever you want to call it, pandemic, because I think as the test becomes more available, and that's been a bottleneck here, and it's, it's not been a good story, this test has not been released nearly as fast in the states as it should be, and, uh, re and released faster in South Korea and China, um, I think we're gonna learn about a lot more cases in the United States in the next couple of weeks. So I think this is a very active phase, but it suggests that this transmission, now there's one other bit of bad news, let's just get it all out here. Um, we don't know how long this virus can live out on objects um, uh, this particular virus, there's a lot we don't know about it still. Um, but if we compare it to any other coronaviruses, it looks like this virus can hang around on surfaces, doorknobs and such for maybe a week or so. So um, that's part of maybe later, you know, the basic recommendations, and I would do this, is clean surfaces, public settings, more than you normally would because of that issue. So that's something important also. So that actually does lead me to my next question. Um, what should people do to avoid getting sick? Right. So, uh, uh, okay, so let's just talk about today because I, I think in two weeks we may be talking a different story. Uh, but the recommendations, and by the way, if there's any site any of you visit, visit the CDC website, the Centers for Disease Control website. Uh, check on it daily. Some of you are thinking about trips or have had to cancel trips. And uh, that site will tell you about recommendations that generally we're following in our business and other businesses. It also talks to you about travel and countries and things, and we can talk about that more in the Q&A. Um, but what we're talking about is hand washing, hand washing, hand washing. Um, I, I think soap and water is what I prefer, 20 seconds. Let the water run and make sure you get the whole hand. You can use these, uh, these other uh, disinfectants, but make sure you cover your whole hand when you use it. Um, you're going to wash surfaces, like I just said. Be careful about surfaces. Um, and uh, you're going to, if you're st sick, stay home. And if someone around you is sick, you're going to get away from those people. Since it's a droplet transmission, six feet away is much better than two feet away. So, uh, um, you know, be conscious of that and, and, and as a good citizen, recommend people stay home when they're, when they're sick. These are still the primary recommendations. Masks, should I tackle that? The, okay, the mask issue. <laughs> uh, the, uh, there's no evidence that when you're healthy, wearing a mask will do anything, okay? So don't do that. On the other hand, what it has been used for, and you see this often in folks from China, is that those who are sick themselves, coughing, the mask will blunt the, the, air, uh, the uh, droplets and the aerosols created. So that's why you see uh, the mask provides some protection. Um, actually, they're surgical masks. They're all, you can go around them. They, they don't do much. There are these N95 masks. They're much better. Not completely good for viruses, but you need to be fit tested for your face. 
So that is something that isn't practical and they're not even available for the general public because they're, we're running out of a, our supply chain. So I want to take us very quickly back to the research side um, for just a minute. And Dr. Martinez Sabrita, can you tell us um, specifically what are scientists hoping to, to do right now? Like what's their main goal at this point? Diagnostic test to, to accurately detect if the somebody is infected or not. Um, develop vaccines um, and try to find out in the repertoire of antivirals we have that have broad antiviral activity if some of them has uh, antiviral activity against this COVID-19. So that's at least from, from our point of view uh, what we are trying to prioritize right now. Um, another important thing that we try to do is to develop uh, good animal models that allow us to, and I don't know if you're going to cover that later or not, nope, that's but um, animal models that allow us to study the virus. Um, um, and that's going to be important because it want to provide us with a lot of uh, information that we currently do not know about the virus, like uh, how is the virus infecting, um, how is the virus uh, transmitting. And, and those are important questions because uh, maybe we will not find out how to develop good vaccines or find good antivirals, but we might find out how the virus is transmitted. Mm -hmm. And that will be important to allow us to, if somebody is sick, at least do not transmit the virus. And that's something that we have done with influenza. Um, we, we, we have been studying influenza or in, initially in mice. Um, and that's an interesting story because uh, we found out that, yeah, it's, mice are good to study influenza, but some uh, parts of the, the, the biology of the influenza, but not transmission of influenza. And you know why? Because mice do not sneeze. <laughs> so, so actually, and I didn't know that until I, start, until I started studying influenza. We take a mouse, we infect it with influenza, we put in the same cage another mouse that has not been infected. One, unfortunately, the, the one infected died. The other one is running around happily. And it was, and that's coming back to the, the, what we learned from, from in 19, in 1918 influenza, is that uh, uh, in, in we don't know exactly where the virus originated, but it seems like it was in a military camp in, in Kansas. Um, what they find out uh, by reading the notebooks from, from that military camp is that they have multiple animals. And one of the animals they have in the camp were the guinea pigs. And the guinea pigs start dying. So we thought, oh, maybe the guinea pigs died because of the, uh, the influenza, 1918 influenza infection. And that's what we start, started studying influenza in guinea pigs. And what we found out is that uh, it's a great uh, animal model to study transmission of influenza, guinea pigs. Now, by having this transmission model of influenza, and I wouldn't be surprised that it will also be used to study transmission of this COVID-19, we know what are the best conditions for the virus to transmit. And we can play around with the temperature of a room or with the humidity of a room to prevent the virus to easily transmit. So we might not be able to prevent infections with the virus, but we will be able to prevent that somebody that is infected transmit the virus uh, to another by establishing these uh, transmission animal models. And that's why animal models, and they have a lot of expertise here at Texas Myomet, are so important to study um, not only COVID, but other respiratory viral infections. So, I was gonna, okay. So, uh, Texas Biomed was built for the crisis we're in. Uh, and uh, and uh, our goal, as you hopefully many of you know, is to be the global leader in eradicating infection in the world. And so this is our time. Um, I want to say that uh, Dr. Martinez is now our 12th new faculty member at Texas Biomed. Humble guy, love him. But when he was hired, um, we got calls from all around the country. We can't believe that Dr. Martinez is coming to Texas Biomed. He's very well known. If you need a virus made, he's the guy to make it. So, you know, people say, where are you getting the coronavirus? He can make it. Uh, and uh, I just want to make it very clear that we're active in coronavirus research now <clears throat> at Texas Biomed. 
And we have at least three or four projects and a team of five investigators. And I think, um, and money uh, is becoming available because the NIH is prioritizing this research right now. The primate centers, who are one of seven in the country, are allocating funds for coronavirus. And we're exploiting all of those mechanisms to acquire funding to pursue these projects. And the one that uh, Dr. Martinez emphasized, and I want to put an explanation point on it, is the animal model. Uh, because there is no animal model today. Uh, and you need those models to bring something to market, be, be tested rigorously in the so-called preclinical space. So we're going to be active in the next several months, uh, uh, year on this work, and I'm very excited about the science going on. If we nail the animal model, and we're the first in the country or world to do it, you'll be reading a lot about us, not just the local news, but the national news. This is a real opportunity for us. So, uh, Larry, that's a great lead into my, my last question. You know, what are we, what have we learned from past um, outbreaks, and what are we learning from this outbreak that we need to take into the future for scientific research? Okay. So we don't learn a lot from outbreaks of infectious disease is the problem. Um, and I'll give you the four points here uh, that um, I think we need to highlight and why we need to literally transform research in infectious diseases. One, and we've already mentioned this, is that we start behind the eight ball. Um, when things are not in the news for infectious disease, we don't think about it, we don't resource it effectively, and we're not prepared for the next outbreak. And I think that's pretty clear, and that's what's happening here. The second thing I would say is that if anyone had any doubt about the link between infectious disease outbreaks and the economy, hopefully you don't have those questions anymore. You shut down China, there's a problem. Uh, and I think that this is not an if, we'll get over corona and there'll be the next outbreak. I guarantee it. So um, the question is, can we do it differently? So for example, could we create a universal vaccine for coronaviruses using expertise like Dr. Martinez and have that stockpiled and ready, okay? That's feasible. He's come to Texas Biomed to make the universal vaccine for influenza. Um, we can do this. We can be the institute to have a forward-thinking agenda. And why do we do that? Because we need to save human lives. And now when I tell you that by 2050, it's been estimated that infectious disease is the number one killer in the world, more than cardiovascular disease, 10 million extra human lives a year, and to the cost to the global economy of $100 trillion excess of today. Those are real numbers. This is a problem. You know, I, I'm not creating hyperbole. This is real. The third thing we need to learn is that to bring drugs and vaccines to market, you need animal models and we don't have those. So that's a lesson learned uh, that needs to be learned. And lastly is this issue about what happens after. During the Ebola outbreak, I was on CNBC. I wasn't happy because the interviewer was giving me questions that they didn't prepare, you know, they, they were new questions. And I stopped them and I said, look, I want to talk about the fact that when this Ebola crisis in West Africa is over, um, nobody's going to be talking about this. And that's a problem. Um, we need to be prepared for the next outbreak. By the way, we weren't in, in, uh, in the Congo uh, with the current outbreak. We weren't prepared, again, but we had some drugs coming through the pipeline and uh, Texas Biomed tested all of them in our primates for Ebola. And one of our greatest, most recent accomplishments is that we predicted the efficacy of two of the drugs. The best drug was a, Rege a company, Regeneron, uh, and, that com and that drug is now in the Congo saving lives as a result of the work done in Texas Biomed. I'm very proud of that. Regeneron is now a strong partner of Texas Biomed, and, and so they're interested in testing some drugs as, we, as they get further along for uh, the coronavirus outbreak. And I know I said that was my last question, but I did, rec I did remember. Um, so there's currently a, vac a vaccine candidate, Remdesivir, I think is the right name. I may have said that wrong. Um, Therapy. It's a ther I'm sorry, antiviral. Yeah. Um, see, that's why I asked you the question, the difference between antiviral and vaccine. It looks like I didn't explain it well. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's on, so we're looking at trying to, that, that's 
being tested currently um, that's being looked at, it actually was being considered for another disease. So one of the things that, that comes to mind is obviously the need for basic research because even though we have research on a potential antiviral in one disease, it's actually showing to be potentially uh, efficacious in something else. Yeah. So can you tell us a little bit about that particular um, antiviral? Well, in, in, the part, in this particular case of this antiviral is beneficial because we might find these compounds or drugs that have broad spectrum antiviral activity and they can be used for multiple viruses. We are finishing year one of a 10-year vision uh, and it's extraordinarily expensive uh, and uh, more than what we've ever done before. Uh, but we need partners, we need the community, uh, we need to spread the word as step one, uh, and I know Lisa and her team working every day to build brand for Texas Biomed, and uh, we're uh, working not just in the state, but nationally. Uh, so um, we just need to do this together, gang. I came to San Antonio because um, I've never seen a city as engaged, community civic-minded engaged in biomedical research as I've seen here in, in San Antonio. Uh, and we have something special, it really is. I mean, this isn't my first city, seven, my sixth state of residence here, uh, but I think it's a special city for the kinds of things we're doing, uh, and we need to get engaged. We need to do something about this. Um, it's very, very important, so thank you. Thank you all for coming out here today.